Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. We have invited back Roger Dooley, the author of Brainfluence and an expert in the area of neuromarketing. It's basically the science of how the brain really works in the area of emotion, buying and selling, making decisions, how the subconscious works, and how this science influences most of our decisions that we think we're making with our logical mind, but have already been made emotionally on some level. Now, a few years ago, when I first heard about neuromarketing, I really was under the distinct impression it was going to be used to overtake people's free will to make buying decisions. And I've had, obviously, issues with advertising, the way advertising has manipulated the public. But in fact, there are some incredibly important things to learn about neuromarketing, because whether we like it or not, our brains are actually making decisions that we don't even know about from the ancient brain. I've read the book Brainfluence, which I think for those of you that are interested in being more effective, in really harnessing your success in life, you should pick up this book. It's called Brainfluence, 100 Ways to Persuade and Convince Consumers with Neuromarketing. We're going to tell you why. I don't work for Roger Dooley, but I felt that the book was done tastefully. It was very practical, lots of applications, a lot of interesting material. We've done two shows with him. One of them was called Selling to Ancient Brains a few years ago, and one called Neuromarketing. And because a lot of the brain is managed by the subconscious, like 95% of all our thoughts, emotions, and learning occur subconsciously, it kind of begs the question, why is it that most marketing targets 5% of the mind that's rational and conscious? We're going to talk to Roger about this. I've made all kinds of notes and expanded the discussion. He's been very patient with me. We did a great third show, and I forgot to hit the record button, apparently, on a new piece of software. And then we tried again, and my computer didn't work. It was crazy. So I've been told that the third one's the charm. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Roger Dooley. Back to its rainmaking time. Good morning. Well, good morning, Kim. Glad to be here, and hope that third time is the charm. (laughs) If it's not, I'll have to meet you in Barcelona. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> what, you're going to Barcelona in about a week to 10 days? Uh, yes, mm-hmm. yeah, about that time, and look, looking forward to it. Are you speaking Spanish? No, I uh, I have a little bit of Spanish, but not too much, but I'll, I'll be able to get by. You will. You're uh, very confident. Do you have translators? <laughs> no, uh, actually, uh, this, this is just a, a vacation, so I don't have to deliver any speeches, although I have done... Uh, Last year, I did quite a few speeches in Latin America where I had simultaneous translation, and that that was an interesting experience. I would imagine. I just got back from Spain. I spent two weeks there and went to a few places, but I miss Barcelona, so I'll definitely have to talk to you when you come back. (laughs) This will be a first time for me, so I'm looking forward to it. Have a great time. I hear it's a fantastic place, and people have a great time there from all over the world, and they flock there, so you're going to be in good hands. Looking forward to it. All right, let's talk about prices and expectations. I want to take some of the material out of the book and just give some flavorful discussion for the audience. You say on page 17 that the higher prices really are perceived as having higher value when people are paying for it and that discounting really reduces the quality of the customer experience. And yet so many business people feel they have to sell cheap. Why is that? And where did you get that information that confirmed that the higher prices actually have a different kind of experience on the customer? Well, I think there's two aspects to this. Uh, The very practical aspect is that uh, sales and lower prices do drive sales volume. There's absolutely no no doubt about that. Uh, Ask any merchant who uh, has a store, whether whether it's online or brick and mortar, uh, and then runs a 25% off sale, uh, and their sales will definitely go up. Uh, the uh, flip side of it, uh, and this is really uh, more true for uh, luxury brands or products that are perceived of as being uh, either very high quality or luxury. Uh, in those cases, uh, price is one signal that this is a high quality product in the same way that uh, the packaging of the product is particularly important. Uh, If you buy uh, a very expensive watch, 
uh, and it, if it came in a cardboard box, uh, you would immediately suspect that it was a knockoff or that there was something wrong with it. It was used. Uh, on the other hand, uh, traditionally, that kind of product would come uh, in a very elegant package, uh, perhaps uh, uh, with a nice uh, padding and leather and uh, uh, velvet inside or something of that nature uh, that would say, okay, this is uh, a very high quality product uh, that uh, even the packaging is very important. So uh, price is uh, uh, one of the signals. It's one of many signals that people use. Uh, I think that uh, uh, packaging is one. Uh, advertising is another. Uh, luxury products uh, typically are sold in uh, a way that is designed to underscore uh, the their luxury aspect. And if you saw uh, a very generic looking ad for a high-priced automobile or piece of jewelry, again, you would uh, find that dissonant. Uh, I was just talking to, I think it was um, uh, Carl Marcy from Interscope Research about a how changing the font in an ad uh, to an elegant font uh, for a luxury product actually increased sales, uh, where oftentimes we associate a very simple fonts with uh, greater fluency and higher sales. In this case, uh, the uh, more elegant uh, font added to the connotation of luxury. So uh, I wouldn't overemphasize the fact that higher prices uh, are always good for your product, uh, but uh, price is one part of the uh, the mix. Uh, and to uh, go down that road just a little bit farther, if you were selling a product uh, based on price, uh, having a, a price that ends in nine uh, is uh, has been shown to uh, increase sales uh, versus prices ending in other digits. Now, this isn't necessarily universal, but in this particular test, a, a, a dress priced at $79 uh, outsold the same dress when it was priced at either $74 or $84. So uh, the startling thing there isn't that it outsold the $84 one, which you might expect, but that it also outsold the cheaper $74 price. Uh, however, uh, this and the reason psychologists think for the nine effect uh, is that people associate it with a sale. Uh, we've been programmed, at least in uh, the United States, to uh, expect sale prices to end in nine. So when we see a nine, uh, a little part of our brain is saying, hey, uh, there's a value there. Uh, and uh, conversely, if you were selling a $25,000 watch, you would not necessarily want to price it at $24,999. You would probably be better off uh, sticking with the $25,000 even uh, because uh, you wouldn't want it to look like a discounted product. Exactly. Very interesting. I want you to go back a little bit and talk about the font because like I've seen books, great books with fonts that were off. The packaging was good, but the front cover font was off. And I had this immediate knowing that that font is not going to give that person or that group the sales they want with the book. It's discordant for the subject matter. What do you think about that? Well, I think that's definitely true. And uh, as in the luxury uh, oriented font that I mentioned, uh, but I think there's an, uh, so naturally uh, every element of the uh, marketing mix for a book or any other product uh, ideally should match. So, uh, you know, for a book cover, I think having uh, the right font, the right cover art, uh, it's got to be appropriate right, for that topic. Uh, uh, and that, that's true of any uh, product or packaging. Uh, things have to be consistent. As soon as you get that lack of congruency uh, between one element uh, of it, immediately that sort of sets off uh, some alarm bells for the consumer. They may be subconscious, but the consumer is perceiving that something is not quite right there. And uh, one of the more interesting aspects of fonts, though, and I alluded to it uh, in my previous comment, was uh, a fascinating experiment that showed how the font that people see something in influences their perception of the difficulty of what they are reading. Now, this is a kind of a strange mental leap, but uh, scientists at the University of Minnesota ran an experiment where uh, people saw a two-sentence description of an exercise program. It was a very simple little thing where you were to 
tuck your chin into your chest, then raise it up and repeat six to 12 times and so on. Uh, and uh, they were asked, uh, how, uh, how long would it take to perform these exercises? And when they saw it in an aerial font, which is a very simple, easy to read font, they guessed that it would take about uh, eight minutes. When they saw the exact same words uh, in a harder to read brushy font, now it's certainly totally legible. It's just that the brushy font is the, it's the kind that's used in sign making and uh, looks vaguely like brush strokes. Uh, they estimated that it would take about 15 minutes. So just about twice as long, which is absolutely astounding that two groups of people could read the exact same text and one group would estimate the time required to perform the exercise at almost twice what the other one did. So that's, that's huge. Uh, if you are asking people to do something, perhaps on your website, you're asking people to complete a form uh, to uh, get more information or something of that nature, simply putting that in the wrong font could maybe make people think that it was twice as hard as it would be otherwise. And in fact, uh, twice as hard as the reality, because uh, in no case did the reality of how long it would take uh, to do those exercises change. It was merely the perception uh, that changed. Uh, and that concept is called fluency. Uh, and it, it pervades a lot of what we do. Things that are hard for our brain to process uh, can transfer uh, into other activities, much like the uh, exercise program uh, timing did there. Uh, there was no change in reality, uh, but uh, the fact that it was a uh, disfluent font uh, made it seem more difficult. So uh, things like large blocks of text, complex language, hard to read to type, even for example, if uh, instead of having a nice uh, a black on white type uh, on a website, uh, which is very easy to read and is probably the most fluent uh, possible combination, uh, putting it in reverse type or perhaps a, a dark gray type on a medium gray background, something like that, um, that will reduce the fluency and have that same effect of making things seem more difficult. I've seen websites that were black with white writing, and it was so insane to try to read what they had. Even if they had good content, I gave up on them. It was just well, too hard. Well, there, there's actually an interesting experiment that backs that up, Kim. Uh, and psychologist uh, Adam Alter had his grad students analyze the posts on a confession site. Now, <laughs> the uh, confession sites, uh, I've, I've never hung out at them, but uh, apparently uh, these sites allow people to confess to misdeeds uh, that have, they have uh, performed in the past uh, and sort of own up to them anonymously. Uh, so when uh, you, know, you ate your coworker's lunch one day, uh, and you're not going to admit it to the coworker, but you might go on a confession site and admit that. <laughs> uh, and they had a sort of an unwitting A-B test where this confession site originally had exactly the kind of appearance that you describe. It was a black background with white type. Uh, and then they decided that was um, not the design they wanted, and they switched to the reverse with a much more normal uh, black type on a white background. Uh, and when they analyzed hundreds and hundreds of confessions, they found that uh, in the more fluent mode, which is the black type on white background, people were more willing to uh, reveal details. Uh, each of their confessions was uh, analyzed for how revealing it was. And they found that people were much more revealing uh, on the more fluent site. So uh, it's kind of a strange little experiment, uh, but it underscores uh, how these subtle effects uh, can have an influence on behavior. I like that you're gathering all of this evidence and bringing it to the public, because if we were to all wait on ultimate peer review, which is often very controlled studies that could take years and years, we wouldn't be getting all these goodies now and be able to start making adjustments and refining the way we do things. So I really appreciate your work. Right. Well, uh, well a lot of what I do is simply taking studies that are actually uh, very rigorous academic studies uh, and have been published in major journals or sometimes minor journals uh, and translating that into business advice because often uh, the scientists uh, are simply not focused on business applications. I mean, that's, that's not their thing. Their thing is uh, discovering uh, why people do things and uncovering the mechanisms for that. 
uh, they aren't really focused on, okay, what's, uh, what's a practical way that a website owner can uh, apply this? Uh, so I, I try and bridge that gap. I want to talk about some fun, juicy stuff in your book. I want to talk about the right ear, talking to the person's right ear. This is wild. Talk a little bit about what the right ear science tells us. Yeah, this is kind of strange. <laughs> and uh, I don't really have a good explanation uh, for it. But uh, uh, when scientists uh, went into a nightclub uh, and made requests of people, they found that uh, if they spoke into the right ear of people, uh, they were more likely to get compliance than if they spoke into the left ear. Uh, now, uh, they uh, didn't really have any definitive mechanism for why that happened, uh, but it um, uh, suggests that, uh, you know, uh, perhaps if you're arranging your conference seating, uh, you should uh, arrange it in a way that uh, the, uh, you have the right ear of the decision maker. Very, very interesting. I think I'll try that the next time I go into a pub. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, um, it, it is odd. Since I don't drink anyway, but except rarely. Let's talk about selling to men and women and women and men selling to women and men and the distinction and what are some of the things that you've learned that are effective? Well, uh, gender differences are always a fascinating area for psychologists. And uh, there are a couple uh, prominent ones, I think, that apply to marketers. Uh, and the biggest is, uh, I, well, it goes back to evolutionary psychology. Uh, uh, people like uh, uh, Jeffrey Miller, uh, uh, author of the book Spent, believe that a lot of our behavior today in today's modern high-tech society uh, with all the social constraints we have in our behavior I mean, particularly in the United States uh, uh, today, uh, all of our behavior, particularly in a business environment, is very tightly constrained by uh, societal rules, legal rules, uh, business rules, and so on. Uh, but uh, he suggests that uh, our behavior is really being driven by those uh, behaviors that were formed back in our caveman days. Uh, and the biggest one that he talks about is uh, the uh, mating instinct. In fact, one of his books is The Mating Mind. Uh, that uh, specifically deals with uh, how important this mating instinct is. And, and what that does not mean uh, is that uh, uh, people are constantly looking for uh, uh, mating partners. But what it does mean is that uh, there are these subtle cues uh, that do change our behavior. And there's lots of scientific evidence that, uh, for instance, uh, the uh, behavior of uh, males uh, can be changed by showing them a picture of an attractive woman. Uh, they will become uh, more uh, impulsive, more short-term oriented. Uh, and scientists test the short-term orientation by uh, offering people a deal. For example, uh, Kim, uh, I'll give you uh, $5 immediately, or in 30 days, I'll give you $10. Now, uh, unless you're in immediate need of $5, it would be very logical for you to say, well, fine, I'll take the $10 in a month. Uh, but what they find is that uh, they, uh, if they give men that uh, uh, kind of a choice uh, without that mating cue, uh, the picture of the attractive woman, uh, the majority will choose the uh, logical long-term approach of saying, I'll wait 30 days. But uh, when they cue them with a photo, they can uh, shift that mix uh, so that many more choose the short-term option. Uh, and one of the more fascinating studies that uh, I've seen was an actual real-world experiment. This wasn't a lab experiment. This was a direct marketing test done by a South African bank uh, where they mailed 50,000 uh, direct mail pieces offering loans. Uh, and they had uh, several variations uh, in the contents of these loan offers. Uh, they vary the interest rates, uh, which, of course, a, a low interest rate loan is more attractive than a high interest rate loan. Uh, and they also incorporated the imagery that was included with the offer, which could include either no image, uh, a picture of a woman, or a picture of a man. Now, these weren't uh, uh, particularly salacious pictures. They were just a picture of an attractive woman who might be, say, a bank officer or a teller or something like that, uh, and the same for the man. Uh, and what they found was that the uh, women who received the mailings uh, were not particularly influenced by the uh, imagery or lack of imagery, but 
uh, the men who received the picture of the woman with their loan offer uh, responded at a much higher rate. In fact, uh, they calculated that the lift in response rate uh, from including this picture of a woman uh, was equivalent to a 4% lower interest rate. So if you're a bank, uh, which does it make more sense to do? Uh, give away four points of interest uh, to get uh, more, to sell more loans or uh, include this essentially free uh, image of a woman to your male customers. So uh, that uh, is a surprising result uh, and it shows the effect. And that's, that's why uh, you'll see sometimes uh, totally irrelevant photos of women, you know, an ad for computers that uh, uh, has uh, a largely irrelevant picture of an attractive woman in it, uh, perhaps in a short skirt or something like that. And uh, I think the danger with that sort of approach is that uh, it's also a uh, turnoff to people. It looks, uh, it, it borders on unprofessional or Discordant. Uh, just, yes, yeah, yes. Discordant. It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's just not making sense. Uh, but certainly uh, when you see uh, products uh, like uh, beer or shaving cream or something of that nature uh, that uh, uh, incorporate an attractive woman, uh, that is uh, part, that are geared to men. That, uh, that is why they are doing it. Uh, and also, uh, typically, uh, some products, particularly, uh, say, grooming products, uh, are specifically designed to make a man more appealing to others. So uh, there you've got sort of the double whammy. You also wrote a little bit about when a woman has dilated pupils, that picture of her can bring in more interest, business, awareness, and purchases from men. How did you, know, you find that out? Well, uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't discover that myself. That was a piece of research, and I, I don't recall uh, who the uh, uh, research team was on that at this point. But uh, the uh, uh, dilated pupils are often an indication of interest, really, in, uh, in either gender. So when uh, uh, I've heard salespeople talk about that, if uh, they're on a sales call and they see the um, a uh, person's pupil, uh, pupils dilated that they're probably more likely uh, to be interested in the offer. In fact, uh, poker players supposedly respond in that manner uh, where if they have a good hand, their pupils are more likely to uh, dilate. Uh, and that's why you see so many of these uh, poker players on TV wearing dark glasses. I was going to say. <laughs> they don't want their eyes to give them away. So uh, it's, it's undoubtedly a related effect. And only it's the kind of thing that uh, is so subtle that if you didn't know about it, you would never uh, realize it. You would never think about it if you were looking at the ad. And it's a great example of a subconscious effect because if if you went back and asked somebody, did you notice the pupils in the model in that ad? They'd say, well, huh? What? No, I didn't. She, uh, she had eyes. I remember she had eyes, but uh, <laughs> uh, that's that's about as far as you'd get. You talk a little bit about smell, which I thought was interesting having to do with marketing and branding. And when people think of marketing and branding and sales, unless you're in person, people don't think about smell. You said that 75% of our emotions are happening by way of smell. Talk about Marcel Prost and his work. Yeah, um, well, he is famous uh, for his uh, uh, novels and uh, the classic uh, one is where uh, – uh, tasting a or smelling a cookie uh, brings back this whole flood of memories that is the subject of the book. And uh, there is actually some uh, sound neuroscience behind that. Uh, our smells do have the ability to trigger memories. Uh, and hence, uh, that's why they are powerful branding tools if you can get the customer into an environment uh, which uh, A is. Uh, something that is pleasant and good, uh, and that uh, you can control the scent in that area. So uh, some of the people or some of the brands uh, that are at the forefront of scent marketing uh, are companies like Airlines, uh, where they have control, obviously, over the cabin environment. Uh, they have control uh, over their seating areas and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, Singapore Airlines is probably the leader where they have uh, used a uh, very uh, memorable scent uh, in uh, as many locations as possible. And also they provide a very high quality of service because it could work both ways. Uh, if uh, a 
brand was using a distinctive scent and you were having a bad customer experience. You'll remember uh, it. it. Yeah, you'll, you'll remember it and not in a good way. So uh, Singapore Airlines certainly prides themselves on their high quality of service. Uh, and this is a way of uh, evoking that. Uh, and presumably if uh, you had a flyer who had flown their airline multiple times, you could bring back uh, that experience simply by, uh, say, um, a little scented mailing or something of that nature. The uh, hotels also do that uh, because, again, a hotel can control the environment uh, a lot better than uh, some other kinds of businesses. If, if you're you know, a consumer products maker, you can scent your product, but you really can't do much about the environment that it's sold in or that it's used in. For sure. You talked about how when you're having business meetings or any type of meetings, that the altitude makes an impression on the attitude. And I thought that was very interesting. For example, if you're meeting somebody in a basement versus you're meeting somebody at the top of a hotel or in a beautiful area. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, this is another one of those really strange effects. And let me, let me jump back a little bit before I get to that. There's one uh, uh, interesting test uh, with uh, scent uh, that uh, I wrote about in, uh, called it the brute effect. Uh, which is uh, uh, a scientist uh, was teaching several sections of a class. And uh, this, this is probably not the most uh, controlled scientific experiment. It wasn't published uh, in a major journal. Uh, but uh, he uh, had two conditions. Uh, before one of the classes, he always sprayed a little bit of a uh, scent of uh, you know, brute, the uh, cologne, in the classroom beforehand. Uh, nobody ever commented on it or noticed it. And the other one, uh, he didn't. Uh, when they all combined for uh, the test, he again sprayed the brute scent and found that the group that had been exposed to this scent during the learning process through the course of the semester, uh, they outperformed the other group. Uh, and again, this wasn't a uh, you know super highly controlled experiment, so I wouldn't read too much into it. Uh, but it certainly is suggestive of the fact that memories can be triggered by sense. Uh, and in this case, it was learning memories that were apparently triggered. And so I'm sorry, uh, what was the well, well, uh, no, I, I Yeah, no, that's very interesting. I was going back to the part about you mentioning in your book that the altitude makes an impression on the attitude, basically. In essence, that where you meet where you have the conversation, if it's a basement, it's very different than if it's at the top of a hotel or some beautiful area. So talk a little bit right. about that. Well, yeah, th this is uh, one of those uh, sort of chicken and egg things uh, where uh, we associate uh, higher levels with uh, good things uh, like uh, heaven in uh, uh, Christianity and perhaps some other uh, uh, religions uh, and uh, lower depths uh, with hell. Uh, now, uh, <laughs> one, of, one of the uh, experiments that uh, scientists conducted was to see how generous people were uh, under different conditions. And so they set up in a uh, mall where people uh, would either uh, encounter the charity on the uh, ground floor as they walked in or uh, on an upper floor or a lower floor. Uh, and they found that the contributions uh, or volunteer uh, commitments on the higher level uh, were higher. They, uh, and they interpreted it as uh, simply as people uh, reached this uh, sort of higher level, uh, they became more generous. And they even managed to replicate it by uh, showing people uh, pictures of uh, clouds as, say, seen from an airplane. So the people weren't really at a higher level, but uh, they were able to, uh, the scientists were able to reproduce that same effect by implying that people were at a uh, uh, at a higher altitude, so uh, no real explanation for that. Uh, it's just one of those quirky things that, uh, you know, if you are really if you've done everything else to optimize whatever it is your offer is, it's good to take that into account. I mean, I, many of the effects that I talk about uh, are no are no substitute for a. Uh, a bad product or otherwise bad marketing. Uh, these rather are effects that can uh, help you uh, further optimize what you're doing. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. We are living in one of the most exciting and dangerous times in history. 
Many of us are being challenged to turn away from parasitic systems of enslavement and misery and move into different life-giving activities, commercial opportunities, and communities. Transition is upon us right now. The seizure of the world's natural resources, the poisoning of our food, water, and air, and the total electronic surveillance of our lives is forcing many of us to develop new rules of engagement for being in the world. Doing business today is way more complex and nuanced. The electronic age is a mixed bag. If you want to live in a more humane world, don't confuse electronic communication with real relationships or knowing who your neighbors are or how they're doing or the importance of sitting down with your family and having meals together. This is real life. Practically everything we've been indoctrinated to believe about life and work is out of touch with what's available to us today. New discoveries about non-locality and consciousness are not only mind-boggling, they are game changers that require us to embrace paradox and ambiguity. Beings and agencies that insist on using deceptive practices, protocols, and instruments for market and industrial domination will eventually realize they are at the tail of a riveting new industrial complex of markets, projects, and products that they never perceived. This new complex is emerging. Receptivity is a human imperative. Imagination is an agency of transport. The current behind the currency matters. And our children and future generations are counting on us to prepare the way for them. I'm Kim Greenhouse. I'm the chief executive officer of the Rainmaking Company, a manifestation agency, a leadership agency, and a development agency. Feel free to call for our rainmaking services, both on an advisory and development level, 626-398-8652. And back to the show. You say that brands don't build themselves. People build brands. I want you to talk a little bit about branding. There's so much on the internet about branding. And I have noticed that so many marketers feel that they know about branding and many of them don't. They think they do, but they don't. What do you have to say about that? I guess uh, branding is is certainly a very complex uh, area with uh, so much going into it. Uh, The one thing I'd say is, and even since uh, I wrote the book, uh, the challenges brands face are increasingly difficult. Uh, and in fact, brands are no longer uh, really in control of themselves. I mean, they may be in control up to a point and their brand messaging and identity are important, but uh, more and more consumers are in control of that brand image. And, if, if, uh, and partly it's a social media driven thing, uh, but you simply cannot get Uh, your message out there uh, and assume that people will accept it as you're offering it. Uh, And that's that's fundamentally different than it was uh, uh, certainly back in uh, the Mad Ben days uh, that we're familiar with from the TV show uh, or occasionally from actually having lived in that era. But uh, also, uh, uh, even from, say, uh, uh, five or ten years ago, uh, things have changed very substantially. And I think one... uh, uh, example that comes to mind uh, is the uh, Abercrombie Fitch uh, and Fitch CEO, who uh, like uh, maybe about seven years ago uh, made some uh, comments about uh, their brand uh, not being for untra- unattractive or unpopular people, uh, and these were kind of rude, insensitive comments. Uh, and at the time, they did very little to affect the brand. They didn't get much reporting. They were reported uh, in a couple of places, uh, and uh, it pretty much died out. And then a year ago, uh, in today's sort of uh, hyper social environment where you've got this uh, feedback loop of, of social media, uh, blogs, and so on, uh, uh, those comments were resurrected. He didn't say anything new, uh, but somebody resurrected those comments that were six years old, and it became this huge uh, media firestorm uh, that uh, Abercrombie and Fitch didn't like. Uh, uh, unattractive people and didn't, didn't want to do business with them. Uh, and so you had uh, various, um, uh, you know, customers doing uh, videos of giving away their branded products to homeless people to wear around and so on. Uh, and so it, it turned into this uh, huge uh, firestorm that uh, simply could not have happened years ago. And, and so that's uh, the 
uh, key, uh, one key message for brands is they are, they are no longer in control. Uh, and what that means is that brands really have to uh, live what they say. They can't try and uh, communicate one message that, you know, for example, that they're a, uh, you know, a company that really cares about their customers and they make high, high quality products. Uh, if in fact, uh, the products are not high quality or they uh, behave in a way that suggests they don't care about their customers. There was a businessman from the Middle East who purchased the Beverly Hills Hotel and the Bel Air Hotel. And recently there was articles all over the paper and online that he was for the introduction of Sharia law in the United States and where he is. He's invoking Sharia law in the country he's in. I think it's Brunei. Of course, that includes the stoning to death of gay people and all kinds of problems and hardship and horribleness for women. And so what happened is that when he came out in Brunei about this, there was a major firestorm in Los Angeles and the Bel Air Hotel and the Beverly Hills Hotel, a lot of the celebrities and customers walked out and said they will not give business to this hotel anymore. And it's just interesting because when you say people aren't in control of their brands anymore, this is just a small example of how immediate something can happen with the owner of a business, whatever it is, coming out with something. I mean, then it became like a human rights issue. Now the hotels are associated with human rights. I mean, you know, I've always loved them. I've lived near them my whole life. I've frequented them. But now I wouldn't go to those hotels and I wouldn't give that guy my business to save my life. Well, maybe to save my life. But my point is that we are emotional purchasers, whether we like it or not. Even people that say business is business. The thing I find interesting, Roger, is that even when people say business is business, so much of their brain and their energy is used emotionally to make a decision. Where does that come from? Which part of the brain is that? Is that the hippocampus? What well, is it? Yeah, actually, there's no no simple answer to that, Kim, because uh, contrary to uh, popular belief, um, there is never a single area of the brain uh, that is involved in uh, decision making. Uh, and that's why the concept of there being a buy button in the brain is uh, largely uh, a pleasant fiction, uh, because there is no uh, single area that you could somehow uh, activate and say, okay, this is, uh, uh, you know, we're going to do this and people are going to buy. It's uh, rather a uh, balancing of um, many areas of the brain uh, that uh, yield that kind of decision. But I, I do think your uh, comment about the Sultan of Brunei is uh, right on the money because a few years ago, uh, that would not have happened. Uh, perhaps uh, there might have been an article in a few newspapers that very few people would have read, uh, and that would have been the end of the story, most likely. Uh, but uh, now, uh, those things can get picked up by uh, popular blogs, uh, get shared in social media, uh, and uh, can really uh, destroy a brand so quickly. Yeah, and in one sense, uh, I mean, in, in perhaps in this case, uh, if uh, you have uh, an individual that is uh, sort of presenting a false front uh, in a business, uh, perhaps that enforced transparency is a good thing, uh, but it can also uh, really damage a brand where there perhaps there isn't a problem, but suddenly uh, a, uh, you know, a minor incident gets uh, blown up, uh, perhaps even with uh, uh, completely inaccurate facts uh, and becomes a, uh, you know, huge thing in social media uh, before the facts get out. And then unfortunately, uh, once those corrections come out, uh, at that point, it's too late. People already have that association with the brand uh, and uh, denials are never as uh, potent as the accusation or even corrections uh, that occur some days later are uh, never uh, uh, never as effective. I, I just finished a really interesting book. It's a couple years old, but it's by a fellow Austinite, Ryan Holiday. Um, the book was Trust Me, I'm Lying. Uh, and <laughs> it's uh, uh, about uh, his uh, his own machinations as a manipulator of blogs and media, uh, as well as a critique of the whole ecosystem uh, of blogs and social media. Uh, and it was really fascinating, but th that's something that he emphasizes is that the stuff that, uh, that breaks the news, you know, that uh, this company, this company's CEO uh, is guilty of this and that, uh, that makes all the news, gets all the impressions. Uh, and then three days later, uh, nobody sees the retraction 
that says, oops, sorry, uh, you know, this proved to be incorrect. They may publish that, uh, but it's a footnote uh, and uh, nobody shares that. Nobody sees, no, nobody uh, is going to, uh, you know, nothing is going to go viral like that. That's uh, just a retraction of a previously uh, uh, sort of, you know, salacious story. It's the salacious story that goes viral. I was told years ago that bad news sells. And when you look at the television networks and the radio networks, it's obvious that it does. But I had an interesting experience some years ago in 2006. A gentleman invited me to NBC and wanted to share with me how the network looked and how it was put together. And I went into a production room with him. He had been there 30 years. And he said, Kim, what business do you think we're in? And I said, you know, I don't really know what business you're in. You tell me what business you're in. He says, we're in the advertising business, Kim. And I said, okay. I said, so then what's the news? And he turned to me and he looked at me straight in the eyes and he said, Phil, Kim, it's nothing but Phil. <laughs> well, yeah, although. This, yeah, but, you know. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's more than that, though, because it has to drive the eyeballs. Oh, of course. That's the mechanisms. I guess what I'm saying is that he wanted me to be very clear that the networks are in the advertising business and the content is secondary only to get the people watching, but the main business that they're in is the advertising business. And of course, if bad news sells, that's why you're talking about, you know, even retractions of people not doing something bad or they didn't get into trouble or they're not as interesting as the bad news. Well, that's certainly true. And people are looking for a novelty. They're looking for exceptions. A CEO doesn't commit a crime is not a story. <laughs> you know, that that's hopefully uh, uh, typical in, you know, 99% of the, the cases. Uh, it's the uh, one where uh, the CEO is involved in some uh, bizarre shenanigans uh, that is the exception and is a lot more interesting to readers. And unfortunately, uh, as uh, uh, Ryan describes in that book, there's uh, a great incentive to even manufacture this kind of stuff uh, by the blogs, and they, you know, without adequate fact checking, uh, because uh, they too, uh, like your uh, NBC person, are in the advertising business, uh, and their metric uh, is page views and ad impressions. So uh, they simply have to drive a lot of page views, and hence. Uh, the uh, rush to publish things uh, that are both salacious and also to publish ahead of their competition. Uh, because uh, if they wait, uh, somebody else might scoop them on the story and get uh, get the lion's share of the traffic. So instead, there's this sort of uh, uh, what, what uh, uh, is called uh, in Holiday's book, iterative journalism, uh, where you sort of publish and then uh, fix it later. Uh, but the problem with uh, fixing as you iterate, more information becomes available, uh, is that uh, everybody reads the first story and nobody reads the later corrected versions. I want to talk a little bit about storytelling and business success and effectiveness. And I want to talk to you about hiring articulate people. You know, there's a lot of people in a hiring position that don't want to hire articulate people. They feel competition with them. And I know you say in your book that somehow articulate people can read the customer state of mind very well, and they just have a better relationship to the customers. What do you mean by that? Well, I, I think it you know, probably works both ways. Uh, if they're articulate, they probably have a greater communication skills and people skills and will also be perceived that way by other customers. And as far as a uh, hiring uh, manager who is threatened by an articulate person, uh, that that manager is probably a terrible manager anyway, uh, because they they will feel uh, threatened if somebody uh, has better technical skills uh, than they do, or uh, has greater management experience, or whatever whatever area they're in. Uh, and uh, you know, anytime a manager would base a decision on, uh, gee, this person might be competition for me, uh, that's a manager you do not want in your company, uh, and uh, certainly. Uh, smart entrepreneurs and smart managers everywhere uh, take the opposite approach. They try and hire people who are smarter than they are, who are more skilled, who, who bring different strengths and so on. Yeah, that's if they have the training and they have the maturity to know that that's the best decision to make. Well, yeah. Well, entrepreneurs that uh, lack 
that uh, simply it's uh, that's a self-correcting problem. They go out of business. Uh, although sometimes these people can survive in larger organizations where uh, there's some tolerance for mediocrity. But what you, what you have is a, a mediocre person who ends up recruiting even more mediocre employees because they don't want to feel threatened. Uh, and uh, it, even uh, large organizations uh, typically only tolerate mediocrity, uh, mediocrity for so long before uh, they say, hey, our results are suffering in this area. Uh, we need to uh, clean house, get in some different management and fix it. I like the part in your book too, where you talked about talking to the customer and actually telling them to trust you. I thought that was a very interesting dynamic. Talk a little bit about invoking trust from the customer. Yeah, uh, this was a fascinating little test uh, that was run with a print ad where uh, subjects were shown a an ad for a service provider of some kind. I don't, I don't recall exactly what kind of business it was, but they were uh, a local service provider. Uh, and there were two versions of the ad. Uh, one of them contained uh, the words, you can trust us to do the job. Now that's a, a pretty simple little statement. It's not offering any superlatives. It's not saying they're the best uh, or providing any sort of comparison or even any factual backup. It's just saying you can trust us to do the job. And amazingly, the ad that contained uh, that phrase uh, created uh, a significantly higher impression, like a 33% higher impression of uh, not only trustworthiness, but competence uh, in the minds of the uh, viewer. So uh, the moral of that is uh, sometimes all you need to do is uh, tell folks you can be trusted. Hopefully you can be trusted to do the job. Uh, but uh, simply underscoring that fact uh, will give them a little bit more confidence uh, that you are able to do it and that you're telling the truth. I think it works also because the underlying subtext between a buyer and a seller that's going on is mostly in the feeling tone of the interaction of, can I trust this seller? And it's usually not talked about. So I think if a seller brings it to the open and addresses it, it creates the space for trust to be invoked and to happen as well. Right. And and I'd emphasize too, that, Kim, this is a print ad where the test was run. Uh, if you were involved in, say, an in-person situation where you are uh, say on a sales call or something of that nature, uh, there you've got a lot more going on. Uh, you've got all these factors of uh, body language, uh, uh, first impressions, uh, and first impressions are very, very important. Uh, I just did a post a week or two ago about how uh, first impressions are formed within a fraction of a second of, uh, say, seeing a photo of a person. Uh, and then they are very hard to change after that, uh, even if there's evidence presented to uh, that contradicts that first impression. So uh, the uh, and this is kind of bad news, I guess, because it's uh, sort of an irrational thing that happens. Uh, but first impressions are based on appearance; they're formed very, very quickly, uh, and they're hard to change after that. So uh, that uh, uh, that's kind of perplexing. Uh, but it's something that uh, we all have to deal with, whether we're presenting ourselves on the web or in person. Talk a little bit about loyalty. I think loyalty is very important, and it's something that most salespeople don't talk about, actually. They just do their thing. Well, I think there's different kinds of loyalty. Uh, one certainly is a loyalty that uh, builds up over time and is built, in, at least in part, on what the a uh, brand does and the trust that develops, the fact that uh, a company has not let the person down uh, and that loyalty will develop. Uh, but there are ways to uh, manipulate that loyalty, if you will. Uh, one of the classic examples to me is a sort of uh, us-them strategy. Uh, a, a psychologist years ago uh, developed a theory of social identity. Uh, and what he found was uh, this was uh, Henri uh, Teifel, uh, he found that people could be made to identify with a group uh, with only the flimsiest of excuses. So uh, he could take a, uh, say, a class of students, uh, divide them into two, uh, and say, okay, uh, uh, you folks uh, have the computers with the uh, green border on the screen, and you folks have the computers with the red border on the screen. And 
uh, pretty soon uh, he would have them identifying with that group uh, and uh, not only uh, support, being supportive of their own group, uh, but also uh, becoming uh, uh, rather negative and uh, destructive toward the second group. Uh, the, in fact, those same things reinforce that group identity uh, when you have a common enemy. So uh, the best example of this that I've ever seen is what Apple did uh, almost from its very inception. Because uh, even today, uh, there are probably no more uh, motivated product owners than uh, uh, Mac owners uh, compared to PC owners. You know, ask, ask a Mac person why they don't use a PC and uh, it will seem like a, a a uh, religious sermon, perhaps, uh, as opposed to uh, a rational enumeration of features and benefits. Can I start and, with my? my <laughs> I'm a Mac user, and right, I was right. I was a Windows user. I was a diehard Windows user, and I swear I will never, ever, ever use a Mac. Okay, and one day I was working on a project at a friend's house who had a Mac, and I didn't want to use it, and I didn't really associate myself with it, and it kind of grew on me over time. And before you know it, I was in the Mac family and they're so pretty and they're so <laughs> such nice ecosystems. And I think for many of us females and creatives, we can't seem to unhook from the Mac experience. What can right. I well, say? They, yeah, they did target uh, creatives initially, uh, both with their software. And, and part of that may have been accidental. Uh, they ended up with some uh, great early software uh uh, like uh, Aldous PageMaker that uh, was uh, particularly well-suited for people with a creative um, orientation. Uh, but then they emphasized that in their advertising. But something that they did was uh, uh, very early on uh, identify themselves as being uh, different than uh, the rest of those folks, which the PC owners. So the, the classic 1984 commercial, <laughs> uh, probably, the, probably the best commercial of all time, uh, it's not an accident that uh, the uh, PC owners uh, are, at least the implied PC owners, uh, are these sort of uh, gray drones marching in lockstep. And then uh, you're seeing <laughs> this, uh, uh, you know, giant uh, uh, face on the screen uh, telling them what to do, uh, where the presumed Mac user uh, is this uh, attractive, uh, a colorful young woman, athletic uh, and heroic, uh, who comes in and smashes the big screen. So immediately that's saying, okay, uh, Mac owners are different. We're young, we're exciting, we're creative, we're cool. Uh, we're not those drones. Uh, and then the next year, the, their Lemmings commercial. Was <laughs> I got, love that. Uh, got, <laughs> that. That got far less press. And it, it wasn't I, li really I liked them both. I like all, their commercials were very funny. Yep. Uh, but again, that created this sharp distinction between the uh, Lemming-like business people who are walking off the edge of the cliff uh, and the uh, Mac user who, again, was presented as uh, being a rather a heroic figure who was breaking away from the herd. So uh, they continued that uh, years later uh, with their uh, I'm a Mac, I'm a PC ads, which were totally different in tone. I mean, the, the Lemmings commercial is really kind of a downer, uh, but uh, the uh, I'm a Mac, I'm a PC ads were very creative. They were lighthearted. They were funny. Uh, you know, I think even most uh, PC owners got a, a chuckle out of them. But at the same time, uh, they created this sharp distinction between this sort of uh, young, cool, hip uh, uh, Mac owner, uh, or Mac, not Mac owner, but Mac, uh, and the uh, sort of uh, uh, old-fashioned doofus uh, PC. And uh, the uh, occasion, they actually did get kind of hard-hitting. Uh, when they uh, talked about, uh, you know, uh, lockups or viruses or upgrades and this sort of thing. But uh, they they uh, have always drawn that distinction uh, and their users uh, really fed on this uh, and, of course, became kind of a cult unto themselves. Yes, and they, they did a lot of other smart things with their, uh, you know, releasing new products where people line up outside the stores and so on. And all this uh, sort of creates this cult of uh, Apple that has served them well. But uh, it's uh, the social identity, I think, uh, has been a key part of their success. And, and obviously, uh, their products uh, do have some uh, advantages, uh, not necessarily uh, uh, in every situation, but uh, the advantages are appropriate for their target audience. You know, when Steve Jobs was quite ill before he passed, when the news came out that he was ill, 
Apple's stock price dropped 100 points. And even with the great branding and everything, once you're a public company, once you have stock, there's all kinds of things that can alter your stock position that are all about perception. So people had the perception that he was going to die, that he was violently ill, and the whole stock price dropped. There's a fragility when you get into stocks and what impacts those. A lot of it is perception-based. Yeah, I think in that case, though, Jobs was so identified uh, with the uh, product uh, and the, uh, the leadership ethos sure. and, yes. uh, that uh, it, it was a unique situation. I mean, the sure. uh, chairman of a big auto or the CEO of a big auto company could get hit by a bus and someone else would take that person's true, place. And true. There, there'd be, barely be a ripple for more than a day in the stock market. But uh, in his case, uh, he was seen as the creative driving force, as the person who was able to uh, challenge the norms uh, and get his people to do things that were otherwise thought impossible to, you know, create products that were uh, smaller, that did things that uh, no other product did. So uh, in that case, it may have been justified. Uh, you know, he was not just another CEO. He For had sure. uh, really sort of the golden gut where, uh, unfortunately, uh, most CEOs think they have uh, the golden gut where they can sort of shoot from the hip and make decisions that uh, work out. But uh, Jobs was a real deal in that respect. I wanted to just talk to you a little bit about an example at the post office, just something to think about with perception. The post office in the United States has been going through quite a time on the verge of bankruptcy for many years. Some people are talking about it being commercialized and taken away from the government operations. So it's gotten a little bit creative in some ways in the last few years. But I remember, I think it was 10 years ago, they came out with these stamps, these Houdini stamps. <laughs> And they were so cool and they were so creative and they had such energy emanating from them. And I remember walking into the post office. This is how you know if you're an artist. And I said, I want a thousand Houdini stamps. <laughs> People in line were like, this woman's nuts, you know. <laughs> but even coming up with products, particularly when a business is in trouble, that give the business energy, that give a perception that's not just the post office where these very tight people that are unhappy, that are paid very little money, sit behind the counter and hate their jobs and hate the customers that come in. There's a whole perception of they could care less. But all of a sudden, they started to have these very creative products. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be interesting if that could boost their sales? In other words, they really started to have way more creative products. And then all of a sudden, it's not just a post office. It's this hangout where you can get these cool things. But it's just something to consider. It really doesn't necessarily have to do with brain science, but in a way, it, it does have to do with perception of what you're walking into. Comprende? Right. Yeah. Well, actually, I think they have uh, remade their image a little bit over the years. They right. have become right. uh, more responsive. They are less the government monopoly that these are our hours. Uh, you know, they're, they've uh, extended their hours in some cases uh, to make it more convenient for consumers, and they've offered additional services uh, because they're... Uh, facing, uh, they have been facing more serious competition from a variety of uh, other threats, whether it's UPS or FedEx on the package side uh, or uh, email and electronic delivery of various types uh, on uh, just the general communication side. So, uh, you know, they've they've had to deal with this and they've, they've tried. Uh, their uh, collectible stamps are probably the one area that they have exhibited creativity in for decades. Yes. Uh, they, uh, because they sell their uh, to stamp collectors, philatelists, and uh, they have to be uh, creative and come up with cool stuff, whether it's really great artwork or even just great concepts uh, for a series of stamps. And so that that's an area where they can be creative. But unfortunately, uh, even though I'm sure that's a good profit center for them, because those are stamps that are purchased and never used. They just immediately get purchased and salted away in uh, books or files or whatever. The uh, what really drives the revenue uh, is the uh, delivery services that they offer, uh, and that uh, is is a tough area because, as I say, they uh, they're faced with uh, a big squeeze between uh, declining volumes for uh, traditional mail, which is something that they had pretty much monopoly on, uh, and uh, increasing package volumes uh, where they uh, have some very serious competitors who offer. Uh, both cost-effective services and great trackability and great reliability. So 
Uh, they're uh, they have a tough situation. They still have this, um, you know, this, this sort of government uh, monopoly aspect to them. Uh, and I don't know. I, I'm sure that they'll evolve in some way. Uh, but you know, whether it's, uh, I mean, even home delivery doesn't exist anymore. Uh, if you live in, uh, you know, a neighborhood that's been built in the last ten years or so, uh, chances are you're going to some kind of a community mailbox rather than uh, having something delivered to your door. For sure, and they've taken a lot of mailboxes away from a lot of the homes and areas and blocks. It's, they've been disappearing like crazy. I want to complete this conversation with you by asking you about storytelling and successful business marketing and neuromarketing. Talk a little bit about the storytelling importance and what that means and where does it come in? Well, I think stories are a mantra from uh, for just about all uh, people offering business advice. Uh, if you're in sales, you should be telling your customers stories. If you're a brand, you should be developing a brand story and so on. Uh, the neuroscience aspect, though, is pretty interesting. Uh, we've known for decades that stories really help sell product. Uh, one uh, example that I use in a lot of my speeches is the uh, Capel's ad for They Laughed When I Sat Down to Play the Piano, uh, which ran unchanged uh, for decades. And it's this very old fashioned looking ad that's extremely text heavy. It's got uh, like three or four columns of very tiny print. Uh, and it's telling a story about this guy who sat down at a uh, party to at the piano and his friends all laughed because they knew he couldn't play. And then of course, uh, he amazed them all by playing in a very proficient way and entertaining them. Uh, and it was to sell music lessons, uh, but it was not all about features and benefits about, or about guarantees and this sort of thing. Uh, what really sold was this story. And what neuroscience has told us more recently is that uh, stories affect our brains in some very specific ways. Uh, and uh, at least some scientists believe that our brains evolved to listen to stories. It was a significant evolutionary advantage, for example, uh, for somebody to be able to come back to their early hunter-gatherer community uh, and tell them uh, where there was danger, uh, that, hey, uh, they're the cave that we uh, usually visit uh, now has a bear in it, uh, or, uh, hey, I found a new food source. Uh, and it was important for people to pay attention to these things because uh, they didn't have to experience it themselves. They didn't have to go into that cave and potentially get uh, get eaten uh, to find out about it. So uh, that was a great thing for early humans. Uh, and it appears that we still uh, have a penchant for stories. And one of the experiments that scientists ran was uh, putting people in an fMRI machine that could measure their brain activity in real time uh, while they were listening to a story. Uh, and when that story contained action words like uh, running, punching, hitting, and so on, they found that uh, the motor areas of their brain were lighting up as if those people were performing those same activities. And uh, even though they were immobilized in this uh, fMRI tube, so uh, that that shows that uh, stories do have a power over people. Uh, and an even more interesting experiment used two fMRI machines uh, with a person in each one with one telling the other a story. And when they uh, looked at the simultaneous brain activity of the two people, what they found was that within a few seconds, the brain activity of the person listening to a story synced up with a person telling a story to the point where they were more or less, uh, you know, flickering and activating at this in the same places at the same time. So, you know, if, if you're a Trekkie, uh, if you want to, uh, you know, get to the point of doing a Vulcan mind meld with uh, a customer, <laughs> uh, telling them a story is about as close as you're going to come. Wow. Very interesting. I hope the audience is paying attention to this. <laughs> All you mind melders. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have been talking with, learning from, and listening to Roger Dooley, the author of the book Brain Fluence, 100 Ways to Persuade and Convince Consumers with Neuromarketing. He also writes for Forbes, and he is the owner of the website Neuroscience Marketing. And you can also find out more about him on rogerdooley.com, R-O-G-E-R-D-O-O-L-E-Y.com. You can hire him to do a keynote speech to come and train and work with your teams. 
pick up his book. And Roger, thank you so much for your patience and willingness to do the third charm. (laughs) Well, I hope we got it this time, Kim. And uh, thanks very much for the invite. It's always a lot of fun to chat with you. It's a pleasure. It's rainmaking time. Thanks so much. It's rainmaking time. 